Good morning, friends. Welcome to Hartzell United Methodist Church Online. I'm Pastor Justin. We are so glad that you're joining with us today. We encourage you as we go through this service to make sure to comment in the chat and engage with the other folks who are with us to share uh, this video with your friends as well so that they can join in worship today. Let us open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be stepping into your presence. We ask that you would speak to us clearly. Open our ears, open our eyes, open our hearts to hear from you, that your truth might pierce us right where we need to hear it, that it would bring comfort where we need comfort and challenge where we need challenge. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Our reading for today is coming from the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. Let's hear the words of the Lord. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me then. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he had said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example, that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. This is the word of God that is spoken for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, back when I was in high school, I used to play the alto saxophone in the band. And I don't know if you've ever seen a live performance of a band or a symphony before, but the one thing that is, is unique and true of every single band is that each and every member of that band has a distinct role to play that each part has a different pattern of notes and melodies and rhythms and harmonies and rests. And, and each of those things, as they come together, create this incredibly beautiful piece of music. And I remember those times when I was back in high school and I was practicing my saxophone, not with the group, but at home on my own, and how radically different the piece sounded when I was playing all by myself. It just didn't have the same beauty and the same uh, sense of flow. It, it, it was almost like things were, were absent and, and the piece was incomplete without every individual part. And it required everyone playing together in, in unison with their different parts, following the direction of the conductor in order to create the piece. Every part was necessary. The flutes were necessary, the trumpets, the trombones, the drums, every single piece in the band was critical to that piece. 
There's a story that comes out of the 19th century, a story about the great Sir Michael Costa. He was one of the great conductors of his generation. And, and one day he was conducting a music rehearsal. It was one of these massive orchestras uh, that had a choir with it. And, and he was practicing. And midway through the session, the piccolo player just kind of stopped playing. Now, no one really knows why they did that, but it didn't seem like it would really make that big a difference. It's such a small instrument that doesn't give a, a, off what would seem like that big of a difference. But, but all of a sudden, Sir Michael just completely stopped the playing of the music. And he, he started crying out, stop, 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 where's the piccolo? And, and, and that one part, just that one part being absent, completely changed the piece of music it wasn't the same without it it was incomplete without it and i think the same is the case in the life of the church and in faith that by god's design we are all needed for the church to truly thrive and flourish and become who we are ultimately meant to be ministry in reality is this cooperation that takes place between the pastor and the staff and the board and the congregation and each and every person has a unique role that only they can play. No one else can fulfill it because only the piccolo can be the piccolo and only the flute can be the flute and only the trumpet the trumpet and only people in the church, each individual person can only do what they are created to do. We're currently in a series that is called Disciple What? And throughout this series, we have been talking about what it means and looks like to be a disciple of Jesus Christ in daily life. How it is that we look like him and act like him and think like him and everything that we do. We've talked about the faith of a disciple, the sacrifice of a disciple, the, the love of a disciple, the community of a disciple, and the generosity of a disciple. And today, I want to talk with you about the service of a disciple. You see, more than anything else, Jesus defined his life and ministry as a life of service. A life of service. His life was lived out in service both to God and to other people. When, when, when he actually summarized what his entire ministry was about, this is what he said. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In other words, Jesus says, my life is about one thing. It's about service, that I have come to offer my very being for the lives of other people. And so I think this has something to teach us about service, that if we want to be like Jesus Christ, then we too have to be a people who learn to embody this attitude of service, of sacrificial service towards God and towards other people. You see, a disciple of Jesus Christ at its very core is a person who is moved from simply receiving the mission of the church to actually beginning to take responsibility for it. That it is embracing this idea that service is a part of who we are. It's a part of our identity, our DNA. Our service is the call and the purpose of all Christians. Sue Nilsson Kibbe puts it this way in her book, Ultimately Responsible. If the life of Jesus lives and is embodied in you, then you have joined Jesus on a mission to serve the needs of the world. Not serving is not an option. You've been invaded by the life of Jesus in you, empowered by the Holy Spirit. No longer is serving a choice that's based on convenience. It's a lifestyle in which you now live at every single moment. The life of Jesus in you will lead you to join in where God is working, wherever God needs your hands and your feet and your gifts. Nowhere does Scripture validate the mistaken belief that a Christian's purpose is simply to read and learn the Bible and hang out with other believers, having potluck dinners and fish fries and Sunday school classes. Those activities are intended to prepare you for your real mission, the mission to serve. This is the sole purpose of a life that's lived in harmony with God's intention. Volunteers give up their time when it's convenient and when they personally choose, but servants have a master who is in charge. Servants 
obey for a lifetime. Serving is not something a servant chooses when it's easy or convenient. It's a way of life. It's an identity. It's what we do as believers, not a choice that we make. Mother Teresa once said this, I belong to Jesus. He has the right to use me without consulting me. I'll say that again. I I belong to Jesus. He has the right to use me without consulting me. I mean, that's just so, so powerful, this idea that our life is a life that is meant to be lived out as Jesus desires at every moment in time. And so take a look at this story from John chapter 13. I want to give you a little bit of context from it. You see, travel in the ancient world was pretty much always by foot. It it was in open-toed sandals on roads that were incredibly dirty. I mean, the roads didn't have pavement back then. It was just, you know, dirt roads, gravel roads. They didn't have cars. People mostly couldn't afford horses or camels. And so they would walk everywhere they went with their open-toed sandals on these dirt roads. And that meant that your feet were filthy by the end of the day. Dust is constantly being kicked up upon you. And, and, and so every single house would have this basin just inside the front door where you could wash your feet when you first came in. It was very dirty work, menial work. It was the kind of work that was typically only given to the people on the bottom of the totem pole, the people that didn't really matter much in society. It was the work of a servant or a slave. And in fact, the work was seen to be so degrading and so dirty that even Jewish slaves were exempted from this practice. It was believed to be beneath God's chosen people. And yet here Jesus is, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Son of God, and what he decides to do is wash his disciples' feet. Incredibly radical. That he, he, and it's it almost like it unfolds in slow motion. You ever seen that, that, that movie where... The guy's running, and it's got that really powerful slow-mo movement. Dun, 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 dun. Like, I get that sense as I'm reading this story because kind of every single detail of what Jesus does here is kind of unfolding, right? We were told that, that he uh, gets up from the table. He takes off his outer garment. He picks up a towel. He ties it around his waist. He pours water in a basin. He washes his disciples' feet. He dries them with the towel. It's almost like John wasn't doesn't want us to miss just how radical this is. And so he's telling every single detail in incredibly slow motion so we can get the, the full picture of, uh, of Jesus, this person who isn't supposed to be washing feet, actually doing the work of a servant. This incredibly countercultural image that probably shocked every single person who was in the room probably shocked every single one of his readers. In fact, Peter is so appalled by what is going on. He says, absolutely not. You're not going to wash my feet. If anything, I should be washing your feet because Peter realized that he, he's in this master-disciple relationship with Jesus. And if anything, the disciples are supposed to be serving their master, not the other way around. But yet Jesus says it has to be this way. He insists upon it. He demands it. He must serve them. He must serve us. I mean, everything that Jesus does is about service. And as I was reading this story, I was just shocked by all of the illusions that 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 are really illusions of the cross in this story because this isn't just about Jesus washing feet it's about the service that Jesus does for us when he comes into the world to die for our sins and what we're told at the very beginning that this story happens at the very moment that Jesus realizes his hour has come that he's just about to be taken away from the world, to die on the cross. It happens right in the midst of this discussion about the devil entering Judas Iscariot, who's going to betray him. It happens in the context of a Passover meal where they would be eating a lamb that had been sacrificed in memory of the, the story where God led his people out of Egypt 
out of their former bondage. And, and now there's this greater bondage to sin that God is bringing deliverance from again. The language of taking off his garments and then picking them back up is, is very similar to the language of Jesus laying down his life and then picking it back up on the third day when he's raised again from the grave. And the conversation is a conversation about washing, cleansing from the filth, the physical filth in this case, but there's a deeper spiritual filth. In fact, Jesus tells them, if, you don't, if you're not washed, you have no part of me, which suggests that there's something deeper going on here than just washing physically, that, that Jesus is really talking about this washing from the grime and the dirt and the filth of our sinfulness. And then he goes on to say, you can't really understand this now, but after I'm raised again, then you'll understand what's going on. Because the cross itself is an act of service. An act of service where Jesus sacrificially lays down his life for you and for me. He did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom sacrifice for many, first and foremost, Jesus is a servant. That's how he understands his identity. It's how he understands who he is. It's how he understands what he came to be. And that means as disciples of Jesus Christ, we too need to be people who serve. Jesus sets the example. He says, I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, so you also should wash one another's, that he is the model, the example, the, the one that we're called to follow. And so it suggests that the true goal and essence of what discipleship really is, is service. Service towards God, service towards others. It, it's to live our lives for other people, that, that the life of a disciple is never lived for us. It's never lived for ourselves or our wants or our wishes or our desires. It's always lived for other people. The life of a disciple is not to receive, it's to give. That it's not a life that's defined by greatness or success or fame or power or prestige. It's a life that is the life of a servant and a slave. We exist for one purpose, and that purpose is to serve to take responsibility for the mission of the church. And so I want you to consider just these seven truths that the Bible says about service. The first is this, that you are created for service. You're created for service. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We're created for this. This is how he designed us. And so from the very beginning, what do we see? We see Adam and Eve placed in the garden with a purpose that they are to cultivate and to care for God's world and his creation. We are a people created to serve. Secondly, we see that we are saved for service. 2 Timothy 1.9 says this, It is he who saved us and chose us for his holy work, not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan before the world began. We're saved for this purpose. And so from, again, from the book of Genesis, when we get to Abraham, Abraham is blessed to be a blessing, not to himself, but to other people. We're not saved for us. We're saved to be a blessing for the world, to be a people of sacrificial service. Thirdly, we are called for service. 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. I have always loved this passage. I love how it says that God chooses us and calls us to be a royal priesthood. And I don't know if you think about yourself as a priest before, or, or a pastor before, but that, that's the image that God is saying. It's not just pastors who are called to be ministers and priests. It's, it's the everyday common folk who, who, who sit in the pews, who sit in the chairs every single Sunday, that every disciple of Jesus Christ is a minister and a priest. None of them are excluded, that we are all involved in this same act of service. 
In fact, the word ministry simply means service. Howard Snyder says this in his book, The Community of the King. He says, the New Testament simply does not speak of two classes of Christians, of pastors and lay people as we do today. According to the Bible, the people of God comprise all Christians, and all Christians, through the exercise of spiritual gifts, have some work of ministry. So if we wish to be biblical, he says, we have to say that all Christians are God's people and all Christians are ministers. This clergy laity dichotomy is unbiblical and therefore completely invalid. It, it grew up as an accident of church history and actually marks a drift away from biblical faithfulness. Professional distinct priesthood did exist in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament that's replaced by two profound truths, that Jesus is our great high priest, and two, that the church is a kingdom of priests. This New Testament doctrine rests on, on the, the priesthood of all believers and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Today, four centuries after the Reformation, which fought for this one central truth, the full implications are still yet to be fully worked out. This clergy laity dichotomy is probably one of the principal obstacles to the church effectively being God's agent of the kingdom today because it creates a false idea that only holy men and women, these ordained people, are really qualified and responsible for real ministry. But God says, you are my royal priesthood. You are my pastors. You are the people who are called for service. You are called for ministry. Just think about it. The Greek term church literally means the called out ones. And if we're called out, then that means we have a purpose, that we are called to serve as his priests and ambassadors in this world. Fourthly, we see that we are gifted for service. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, To each one is given the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Notice what it says there. It doesn't say to the pastor alone. It, it doesn't say... To, to the staff alone. It doesn't say to the board. It doesn't even say to ministry leaders. It says to each one, to each and every one. The, the, every single disciple of Jesus Christ has at least one spiritual gift. No one is excluded. We all have something to offer to the purpose of God in this world. The church cannot do without you. It doesn't matter if you're young. It doesn't matter if you're old. God has gifted us all uniquely, differently. And, and what that means is no one else can do what you were created to do. I can't do it. Uh, my wife can't do it. No one can do what you were created to do because no one else is gifted like you were gifted. I mean, Paul talks about it with this illustration of the human body. It says that only the eye can be the eye, and only the nose can be the nose, and only the mouth the mouth, and the hands the hands. I mean, the, the eye could try to do everything else, but if the eye does everything, it might the body might be able to see okay, but it's not going to breathe very well. It's not going to be able to walk very well. It's not going to be able to smell and talk. That, that each part of the body is designed differently because each one has a different purpose. But they're all necessary for the body to function together because the, the human body only works best when every part of it is working. Have you ever noticed that you stub your little toe and all of a sudden everything in your body shuts down? Or you get that one little cold and one part of your body isn't feeling good and so it affects everything else. Right? No two people are the same. Every single person is needed. And, and so... God wants to use you because no one else has what you have. So I wonder what skills, what strengths, what abilities that do you have that no one else has? And how might God be calling you to use those things for his purpose in the world? Fifthly, we see that we are authorized for service. 2 Corinthians 5.20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Matthew 29.18, Jesus says, go, make disciples of all nations. In those words, he gives us authority. He gives us a charge. 
He gives us an authorization, a commissioning to, to go out into the world and to speak on his behalf and, and to serve our fellow man. You see, we don't go in our own stuff, right? We don't go in our own strength. We don't go in our own power. We don't go in our own abilities. We don't even go in our own qualifications. We go in the authority and the power of Jesus Christ. He's the one who enables us. You know, you might feel like you're unqualified. You might feel like you don't have what it takes, but it's not about you. It's about the God who goes with us. He's the one who empowers us for the task ahead. He's the one who equips us. He's the one who calls us. He's the one that covers over our deficiencies. And so I think we need to stop disqualifying ourselves based on what we may have done in the past, what we think we need, what we don't have, what we wish we had, because God is ultimately the one who authorizes and empowers us for ministry. In fact, I think it's when we are weak that we're strong. Uh, you know, it's, it's when we don't have what it takes that we're forced to depend on him even more. Uh, sixthly, your service is needed. Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. That means the, the, the field's ready for the harvest. It's abundant, but the fact is there's not enough people currently getting the job done. Right? The church is only as strong as the person who sits on the sidelines every week. And when that happens, what tends to happen is someone else tries to step into that spot and they might not be wired for it or gifted for it or equipped for it like that person who God wants to be in that spot and so the whole body suffers because we're being pulled in a bunch of different directions trying to do things that we ourselves might not be quite as good at and then finally we see that we'll be held accountable for our service we'll be held accountable for it I'm reminded of the parable of the talents it's a story that Jesus tells about an owner who's going away on a journey and just before he goes away, he gives three of his servants some of his talents, his resources. And he gives one ten, and he gives one five, and he gives another one one. And, and he takes off on a journey. He tells them, use what I'm giving you while I'm gone. And so the first two go off, and they use what God has given them. They double their profits. The, the owner comes back, and, and, and they tell him what he's done. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. And then the third one comes in. And the third one had just went away and he had buried it in the ground. He kept it safe to make sure that nothing happened to what, the, what was the owner's. And the owner's absolutely furious with him. Right? He, he, he wasn't interested in safekeeping. He wasn't interested in his excuses. He didn't, he didn't even care how much of a return he would have got. He says, at least you could have gone down to the bank and put it there for a couple bucks interest. Right? Because what matters to God is it how much we get out of what we, we have? It's that we use what he's given us. That we simply use it. And the results, let them lay in God's hands. All God wants us to do is use what he's placed in our hands. He wants us to be a servant. New Testament scholar William Barclay says this, it's not a person's talent that matters. What matters is how he uses it. God never demands from a person abilities which he hasn't got. But he does demand that we should use it to the full abilities which we possess. And so I want to close today with just a story. A story about a young boy. Uh, he, it was a cold, snowy winter day and this boy uh, was trying to make a little income by selling newspapers. But because it was so snowy and cold, no one was coming by his newspaper stand. And so he decided to pop into the church that was nearby just to warm up a little bit. He was hoping he could maybe catch a nap, but he walked in and because it was snowy, there wasn't a lot of people in the building either that day. And so he decided he'd better pay attention through uh, the worship service that was going on. And so he, you know, stood when they stood and he sat when they sat and he sang the songs when they sang the songs and, and he listened to the message really attentively. And then the offering plate came around and he was sitting there holding the plate, trying to figure out what in the world to do. 
And then he had an idea. And he put the offering plate down on the ground and he got up and he stood inside it. And the people are kind of looking at him, wondering what in the world this kid is really doing. And he looks up and there's just tears just kind of streaming down his face. And he said, Pastor, I don't have any money today because I didn't sell any newspapers. But if Jesus Christ gave his life for me, then I'll give my life to him. And so the question I have for you today is this. How will you offer your life in service to God? If Jesus Christ died for you, how will you offer your life back to him in service? How will you use what God has given you? I challenge you this week, identify one gift that you have and step out in just one way to use that act of service to bless God and to bless others. We'll see you again next week. God bless.